This was the heartbreaking moment. Searchers found the remains of missing hiker Geraldine Largay. Have you ever wondered how many days you can survive if you're lost while hiking? Help! Help me! Help! As we follow Geraldine's daring adventure on the Appalachian Trail, you will know. The medical examiner believes she survived in the wild for about... Discover her sad story filled with unexpected twists and vital survival lessons. Geraldine, known as Jerry to those close to her, was a retired nurse hailing from Tennessee. She loved hiking and often took her grandson on outdoor adventures. She even crafted a quilt depicting a hiker on a trail. Her passion for the outdoors was unmistakable. At 66, Jerry made a bold decision in 2013. She set out to conquer the Appalachian Trail. When in the Appalachian Mountains, you lock all the doors and shut all of your curtains when the sun goes down. If you're outside in the woods, daylight or dark, if you hear something in the woods, you didn't hear anything. Made it to the Appalachian Mountains. So far, no skin. Have you ever felt the urge to tackle such a challenge? The Appalachian Trail is no ordinary hike. Spanning 2,193.1 miles and traversing 14 states, it's the longest hiking-only footpath. Imagine the physical demands, 464,500 feet in elevation changes. Over 3 million people each year attempt parts of this trail, but Jerry had a unique plan. She started at Harper's Ferry on April 23rd with her friend Jane Lee. Their goal? To reach Mount Katahdin in Maine and then flip-flop back. Why start in the middle at Washington, you might wonder? They wanted to experience both the northern and southern parts of the trail. Jerry's husband played a crucial role in their journey. Although not a hiker himself, he provided invaluable support. He didn't hike the full trail due to health issues and a lack of interest, but his contribution was vital. He carried most of their gear. At 66, carrying a 25-pound pack was a challenge for Jerry. Doesn't that make you appreciate the support of loved ones in your endeavors? He would start each day hiking a bit with them, then return to his car and meet them at the next stop. Imagine the comfort of knowing someone is looking out for you on such an arduous journey. Jerry's adventure reminds us that age is just a number, and support makes all the difference. Wouldn't you agree? Jerry, who humorously dubbed herself Inchworm, embraced her slow pace on the trail. It's a unique name, right? She felt like an inchworm, especially when climbing uphill. And guess what? Her husband George also picked a trail name. He chose Sherpa. Quite the fitting title for someone carrying gear and supporting his wife, don't you agree? But let's dive into Jerry's preparation. She wasn't one to take this lightly. Jerry read multiple books about the hike. She even attended special Appalachian hiking courses. How many of us would commit to such intense preparation? Moreover, she completed not one, but two 200-mile practice hikes. That's dedication. Now, about those courses, they weren't your typical survival skill classes. They focused on trail knowledge, shelters, packing, and mental preparation. This raises the question, should survival skills be crucial to such training? After all, knowing how to read a compass or survive in the woods can be life-saving. Let's talk about Jerry and George's relationship. They were married for 42 years and had a life filled with extensive travels. George, despite his back problems, was there for Jerry. He couldn't hike alongside her, but he did his part. He said it was her hike. Isn't that a true testament to their partnership? George's role as a supportive spouse shines through. He recognized this hike as Jerry's dream and did everything to facilitate it. Isn't that the essence of a strong partnership? Jerry's journey wasn't just a physical challenge, it was a culmination of her passions and preparation. 
Can you imagine dedicating yourself so completely to a goal? She showed us that age is just a number. Her spirit and enthusiasm for the trail were inspiring. Despite not sharing the same enthusiasm for hiking, George played a vital role. He ensured Jerry had all she needed. This included meeting them at various points with supplies. Think about it. Isn't it incredible to have someone who supports your dreams even if they don't share them? Their dynamic was a beautiful blend of independence and support. Jerry, with her adventurous spirit, tackled the trail. George, with his practical support, made the journey smoother. How many of us have someone who would do that for us? As they embarked on this adventure, they demonstrated teamwork and mutual respect. George recognized the importance of the hike to Jerry and did his part to make it possible. Jerry, in return, showed the world that determination knows no age. Jerry needed to ensure everything was perfect for her hike. Fair enough, right? We don't have friends like Sherpa on our hikes, but wouldn't that be great? Jerry was one of those friendly hikers who easily made friends. Many knew she feared the dark and disliked being alone. That's a tough situation, isn't it? On June 30th, they celebrated reaching New Hampshire. What an achievement! Unfortunately, Geraldine's friend Jane had to leave due to a family emergency. But Geraldine wasn't ready to end her journey. She decided to continue alone. Remember, her husband was still nearby. She wasn't completely alone, was she? Jane mentioned Geraldine needed a better sense of direction. She often got lost when they hiked together. On July 21st, Geraldine stayed at Poplar Ridge Lean-To in Western Maine. This lean-to is similar to the Thelma Mark shelter we discussed before. It's a basic structure, and hikers often camp around it. Geraldine preferred the lean-to over her tent. She didn't like the dark, remember? She was only 200 miles from the end of the Appalachian Trail. Can you imagine being so close? At the lean-to, she met a southbound hiker named Dottie Rust. Geraldine was going north, Dottie and another hiker found Geraldine there along with Imanich. This detail becomes important later. They stayed up late chatting. They got along well. On July 22nd at 6.30 a.m., Dottie took a picture of Jerry before she left. Jerry looked radiant in the photo. She wore khaki shorts, a red sweater, and a blue and white bandana that resembled the sky. Her blonde hair peeked out. She buckled her backpack, wearing glasses, hiking shoes, and black gaiters over her boots. Isn't it remarkable how a single photo can capture so much of a moment? Jerry's backpack strap sported an orange whistle, an intelligent safety feature. This whistle was noticeable in the photo, showing the lean-to in the background. We're planning to post this picture on social media. What do you think about sharing trail memories like this? The weather was favorable that day, with a high of 72 and a low of 63. At 7.26 a.m., Jerry texted her husband. She was heading north towards Spalding Mountain Lean-To in Mount Abram Township. Their reunion was scheduled for the 24th before 11 a.m. Then, nature called. Jerry veered left off the trail for a bathroom break. Do you know the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, ATC guidelines for such situations? They suggest going at least 200 feet or 80 paces from water, shelters, and trails. Why so far? To maintain environmental hygiene. It's crucial to respect nature when you're outdoors. Jerry was aware of this. Using the bathroom near water sources or trails is a no-go. And leaving toilet paper around? That's a big environmental faux pas. Jerry likely followed the best practices, as should we all. What do you do if you're hiking alone and need a bathroom break? Leave your trekking pole at the entry trail. This serves two purposes. First, it signals others that someone is close by. Second, it prevents others from accidentally intruding on your private space. Jerry lost herself by 11 a.m., four and a half hours past her photo. Isn't it surprising that after successfully navigating over 950 miles, this was the moment she lost her way? At 11.01, the harsh reality dawned on her. Jerry's situation underscores the unpredictability of hiking. No matter how experienced or how prepared you are, 
the wilderness can always throw a curveball. How do we stay vigilant and safe on such treks? Jerry's story is a reminder of the importance of preparation, awareness, and respect for nature. What steps do you take to ensure safety on your outdoor adventures? Jerry messages her husband, George, describing her situation. She strayed from the trail for a bathroom break and now finds herself lost. She requests his help to contact the Appalachian Mountain Club. Specifically, she needs assistance from a trail maintainer near Woods Road. She's not panicking yet. She doesn't ask George to notify the police. This situation reminds me of one I encountered on Mount St. Helens. However, Jerry's location reference is off. She mentions Railroad Road, which needs to be corrected due to her confusion and lack of reception. Throughout the day, she tries sending her message 10 times. Her last attempt is at 12.25 p.m. At 2.09 p.m., she sends another message, this time blank, probably hoping for any signal to go through. Imagine her fear and frustration. A simple step off the trail momentarily leads to being completely lost. Jerry carries a compass, a basic one, with a thermometer, but she might need to learn how to use it effectively. Knowing your direction relative to the trail is essential. It's surprising that many long-distance hikers either don't carry a compass or need help to use one effectively. I have a compass but seldom use it. Jack, my friend, doesn't even own one. He relies entirely on me in the woods, but if you need help with your direction, a compass will only help a little. Jerry's experience highlights the critical need for navigation skills in the wilderness. More is needed to have the right tools. You must also know how to use them. How many of us are truly prepared for such unexpected situations? Jerry's ordeal shows the potential risks of hiking, even for those with experience. It raises a question. Are we equipped with the necessary skills to find our way out of difficult situations? Navigating the wilderness requires more than just a physical presence. It's about being mentally prepared and having practical knowledge. Do we understand how to read our surroundings? Can we make sound decisions when the trail disappears or technology fails us? Jerry's story is a wake-up call for all outdoor enthusiasts. It's a reminder that preparation goes beyond physical fitness and gear. It involves learning and practicing essential survival skills. How many of us can confidently say we're ready to face such challenges? Even if Jerry knew how to use her compass, she might have yet to decide whether to go east or west. Remembering which way she left the trail could be brutal. She knew she was heading north, right? Her decision to head uphill might have been to get a better phone signal. She's lost, confused, and seeks higher ground. It's not the best strategy when you're lost in the woods, but it's something. That night, she camps under a canopy of hemlocks. This makes it hard for air searches to spot her. Why hide under trees? It was pouring rain. Without a waterproof tent, she would get soaked. She even writes in her journal about being in the wrong spot that night. On July 23rd at 4.18 p.m., Jerry messages her husband. She says she's been lost since yesterday, off trail by three or four miles. She asks him to call the police, but this text doesn't go through either. By Wednesday, July 24th, George, her husband, calls the police. Jerry has yet to show up for their meeting. He hoped the rain might just delay her. He waits at the crossroads, asking every hiker if they've seen her. On Thursday, July 25th, Jerry moves her tent to a higher ridge near a creek. She creates a bed from branches and leaves. She has only two days' worth of food left, so she rations it. That night, she eats a few Fritos, almonds and prunes. Very little. Jerry writes in her journal, trying to plan her next move. It's crucial to remember that being lost in the woods affects your thinking. Critics might say she didn't handle things well. But have they ever been lost in the woods? A lost person doesn't always act rationally. How would we act in her shoes? In stressful situations, people often don't reason. Take my experience for example. I got lost with a friend. Both our phones were dead. We had no charger. 
my friend's plan? To find someone, log into Snapchat on their phone, and contact their friends. But I suggested a more straightforward solution, buying a portable charger. In a panic, our brains sometimes miss the obvious. Now, think about being lost in the woods. It's a different stress level, a matter of life or death. We often discuss how unpredictable human reactions can be in such scenarios on our channel. It's one thing to discuss, but experiencing it is another. In a panic, people tend to move faster. Adrenaline kicks in. This might have led Jerry far from the trail, as she mistakenly believed she was close. People's reactions in the wild can be unexpected. Some, when lost, don't even attempt to find shelter or start a fire. They just freeze or fall apart. It's a reminder of how disorienting being lost can be. To find Jerry, searchers and volunteers sprang into action. They covered the ground on foot and horseback. Helicopters and planes scanned from above. Their initial search spanned 13 miles between Spalding and Route 16. The first sweep usually finds most lost hikers. They checked for signs of Jerry being injured, delayed, or taking a side trail. Side trails can be tricky, can't they? They often lead to more confusion and danger during through hikes. In initial searches, the goal is to cover the area quickly. This method often finds many hikers. Search teams also check scenic vistas. Vistas are scenic views where hikers might stray off the trail. It's a sensible strategy. Meanwhile, they ask other hikers if they've seen the missing person. In Geraldine's case, they found no sign of her initially. But they diligently called all the hotels in the area. They checked hotel registries and contacted other hikers to see if they had seen anything. Then, a significant tip comes in. An inn owner receives a garbled voicemail from a hiker. The hiker says she spent the night at the Spalding lean-to with Inchworm. That's Jerry's trail name. This information suggests Jerry might have reached her intended shelter. This revelation dramatically changes the search grid. Later, three men report seeing a quiet woman with dark glasses near the Spalding lean-to. Jerry does wear dark-rimmed glasses indeed. Really? They at last located her? I'll tell you in a moment. The tip about Jerry turns out to be false, merely a look-alike hiker. After spending thousands of hours, the researchers realize their efforts have been in vain. They've been searching in the wrong direction. Can you imagine the frustration of losing two weeks on a false lead? They'd never find her at the Spalding lean-to. In an interesting turn, they secure a warrant for Jerry's phone. This seems necessary, yet it's often overlooked in similar cases. Why wasn't it done in the Terrence Woods case, for example? The warrant reveals an attempted call to Jerry's phone on the day she went missing. Although the call doesn't connect, it causes her phone to ping. This ping places her north of the Poplar lean-to, confirming she went north from there. Hundreds of searchers join dozens of volunteer missions but heavy rain complicates the search. Rain hampers both the search dogs and the searchers. It's dangerous and challenging. Despite these difficulties, the search dogs pick up Jerry's scent multiple times. However, they can't follow it due to the windy conditions in the area. Jerry's family offers a $25,000 reward, hoping to motivate more people to search or provide information. On July 27th, Jerry attempts to resend a July 23rd message stating she's lost off the trail. By this point, her food supply is exhausted. The search is plagued with false tips and leads. This is common when searching for backpackers on busy trails. There's even a report of her being sighted at a shelter. Finding someone in such a vast, busy environment is incredibly challenging, isn't it? After reports of a missing small blonde woman, a sighting of Jerry at a shelter in Tennessee surfaces. There are also reports of her hiking in the opposite direction. Intriguingly, several psychics step forward with various theories. They speculate about incidents like Jerry falling down a hill or breaking her ankle. The number of psychics involved in this case is quite remarkable. 
On July 30th, Jerry's phone shows four last attempts to send a message. These happened between 4.30 and 4.41 p.m. The content of these messages remains unknown, but she was likely trying to resend previous messages. Jerry tries to light fires multiple times. On one occasion, she keeps a fire going for several hours. Growing more desperate, she even tries to set a tree on fire. She hears airplanes overhead and attempts to attract their attention. However, she fears the fire getting out of control and extinguishes it once the planes are gone. What a tough choice, right? Starting a fire for rescue, but fearing its spread. Near her tent are northern white birch trees, known for their flammable sap. In a similar situation, I'd consider lighting one if I heard airplanes. It's a drastic measure, but could lead rescuers to your location. Just remember to carry waterproof matches when you prepare for hiking. Having personal essentials is critical. Two weeks after a misleading tip about a hiker, another hiker named Ivanich confirms spending the night with Jerry at the Poplar Ridge lean-to. Jerry had left early before Ivanich. Expecting to pass Jerry around noon, Ivanich never saw her. This information makes the rescue team realize they've been searching in the wrong area. Jerry never reached Spalding, where Ivanich stayed after leaving Poplar. Ivanich took the same route as Jerry, but has yet to encounter her on the trail or at the lean-to. The similarity in their names, Ivanich and Inchworm, might have caused some confusion. By July 7th, Jerry faces a water shortage. She owns a Sawyer water filter, but doesn't have it with her. Remember, always to bring your water filter. As a former nurse, Jerry likely knows the risks of drinking unfiltered water due to parasites. Jerry also left a GPS tracking unit at her last hotel. Other hikers had told her it wasn't necessary on this trail because it was easy to follow, and she didn't want to carry the extra weight. However, a GPS can be crucial in emergencies. It's surprising she had one but didn't bring it. On August 1st, a hiker named Randy reports hearing someone moaning on the trail in the rim of a bull. Responding to this, searchers hike along the bull, whistling to elicit a response. This location, though, is six miles from Jerry's actual location. By August 4th, the decision is made to scale back the search efforts. Her phone records reveal that on August 6th, Jerry deleted two text messages. It needs to be clarified why she did this. Perhaps she reconsidered sending them, doubting her rescue. In such a situation, what would go through your mind? After July 22nd, there were no more photos or videos from Jerry. This absence seemed strange. Perhaps she was conserving her phone's battery. Jerry tries to power up her phone again, attempting to resend messages to her husband. But after this effort, there's no more activity on her phone. She also writes a final message in her journal, secures it to the front, and places it in a plastic bag. The message reads, When you find my body, please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead where you found me, no matter how many years. She asks for the finder to inform her family of her death and location, regardless of when she's found. She also requests that the bag's contents be mailed to one of them. It's heart-wrenching to think about writing such a message, expecting not to be found for a long time. She even protects the note from the weather in a plastic bag. The note has something written in pencil on the back, but it's indecipherable due to the passage of time. Jerry also writes letters to her daughter and other family members in her journal. Reflecting on the discovery of her tent site, an unfortunate oversight becomes apparent. The authorities should have consulted Dr. David Field, who built the section of the trail where Jerry went missing and owned the land on both sides. He had maintained this trail section for 57 years. Police say they spoke with Appalachian Trail officials multiple times, but David Field was never mentioned. They should have investigated who owned the land surrounding the trail. For an extensive 26 months, the investigation into Jerry's disappearance continues without any breakthroughs. 
As the initial intensive search effort diminishes, it likely transitions into a recovery mission. This shift is heart-wrenching, especially knowing that Jerry was still alive then. Can you imagine the complexity of emotions involved? Jerry's chances of survival were initially high, given her gear and the natural resources available. She had access to water and suitable shelter. Despite this, many search operations tend to conclude within a week. Jerry's preparation for the hike was thorough, yet her survival skills might not have been advanced. It's a stark reminder of how crucial wilderness survival knowledge can be. On October 14, 2005, Lieutenant Kevin Adams from the forest management company Prentice and Carlisle made a startling discovery. He finds a tent while checking an area for hunting activity. This tent, located north of the Appalachian Trail and east of Reddington Pond, lay hidden just a mile from the trail. Search teams with K-9 units had passed tantalizingly close to Jerry's location on three occasions, each time within a hundred yards. Jerry's tent is black with a yellow fly, now flattened from long-term exposure to the elements. Inside, her possessions are neatly organized in Ziploc bags. These include her bandana, rain jacket, rosary, birthday candles, a Mylar space blanket, a blue baseball cap, and two water bottles. Jerry herself is found inside her sleeping bag alongside her journal. The journal bears a pointed note to her husband, encapsulating her final thoughts and wishes. The following day, October 15, a surveyor guides police to the crib site. By this point, the investigators are almost sure the remains belong to Jerry. They arrive at the campsite between 10 and 11 a.m., finding a scene that speaks volumes about Jerry's final days. Her green backpack lies outside the flattened tent amidst a meticulously cleaned area. Jerry's careful campsite arrangement reflects her sense of order, even in desperate circumstances. The discovery of her remains and the condition of her campsite paint a picture that is both serene and somber. What a profound and moving scene it must have been, a poignant end to a long and arduous search. Near Jerry's tent, no sign of a fire being lit. This absence suggests she didn't build a hearth or regularly light fires. Rescuers place Jerry in a white body bag and carry her down the mountain. The investigators who had worked on her case from the start were the ones who took her off the mountain. Isn't it poignant how those who searched for her are also the ones to bring her home? It's frustrating to think that Jerry could have survived for months on the foliage and berries nearby, but she probably didn't know which were safe to eat. Learning about edible plants, especially berries, is vital as they can be tricky to identify. Before hiking in a specific area, it's wise to research the local foliage and berries. I know all the edible berries in our area, do you? Jerry's journal reveals that she made entries every day until August 10th. The consistency of her writing spans from July 22nd to August 10th. There's also an entry on August 18th, but investigators are unsure about the accuracy of this date. If she were alive on the 18th, that would be 27 days after she went missing. She expresses her most profound love in a letter to her husband, hoping to see everyone in heaven. The cause of Jerry's death is determined to be exposure and starvation. What a tragic and painful way to go. Investigators are sure that Jerry got lost and disoriented in the woods. However, this theory gets complicated by a magazine speculation about the nearby Navy training school, SEER, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. The area where Jerry went missing is close to this school. The SEER school's main objective is to equip Navy pilots with the necessary survival skills for situations where they might be stranded or become prisoners of war. Interestingly, a few months after Jerry's discovery, the Ballard, a local marine-based magazine, proposes its theories regarding her proximity to the school. However, it's important to note that these theories lack solid evidence. 
I find this speculation quite doubtful. The idea that the Navy would deliberately leave Jerry in the wilderness and influence her journal entries seems implausible. Doesn't it sound unlikely to you too? Additionally, the Navy's involvement in the search for Jerry contradicts this theory. They began their search efforts the day after she was reported missing, showing their prompt response. The Navy's search teams even reached where Jerry set up her campsite. It's intriguing how many search teams were just a ridge away, making noise and trying to locate her, yet still missing her. This detail highlights the challenges of search and rescue operations in vast wilderness areas. What's also noteworthy is the Navy's voluntary participation in the search. While searching for missing individuals isn't typically part of their duties, their knowledge of the area due to the proximity of their training school proved invaluable. Their willingness to assist in the search efforts is commendable. The magazine raises the point that the restricted access to the military area might have affected the search. However, evidence indicates that army personnel and searchers thoroughly scour this area. Despite the theories about restricted access, the search teams, including military personnel, conducted extensive searches. There's no indication that any restricted areas hindered their efforts. Despite the challenging terrain and vastness of the area, these teams' commitment to finding Jerry is genuinely noteworthy. Seeing the theories that emerge in cases like Jerry's is fascinating and somewhat disheartening. Theories range from plausible to far-fetched, often reflecting the public's desire to make sense of tragic and mysterious circumstances. Ballard's theory, while intriguing, seems to lack concrete backing, especially considering the Navy's active role in the search operations. In cases like these, where multiple factors converge, a missing hiker, a nearby military training school, and the challenging nature of search and rescue missions, it's easy for speculation to run wild. Yet, the facts were made. Jerry was lost, and she wasn't found in time despite a rigorous search. This case underscores the unpredictability and dangers of wilderness exploration and the importance of being prepared for all eventualities. It also highlights the dedication of those who respond to such emergencies, often going above and beyond their call of duty to assist in search and rescue efforts. Isn't it a stark reminder of the need for caution and respect for nature's challenges? Thanks for watching Geraldine's incredible story. If you're eager for more thrilling adventures and survival insights, click right now to watch our next video. Stay curious and keep exploring with us.